The ChatGPT App Store has officially arrived. After being announced earlier in the year in October, it is now possible for developers and product teams to submit apps to the ChatGPT Store. We'll take a closer look at the App Store and what this might mean for tech companies considering building their own apps, as well as all of the other important AI stories from this week. Stay tuned for all of that and more. And as always, if you enjoy the briefing, hit the subscribe and the like button. At first glance, the UI looks remarkably similar to Apple's App Store. And right now, there are three core categories featured lifestyle and productivity. Some of the early apps that are relevant for product builders include the official Figma app, the AHA app for road mapping, and the Lovable app. Lovable published a dedicated page outlining some of the things that you can do with their ChatGPT app. And this includes things like turning conversations into working applications, bringing ideas to life, and creating internal tools on demand. But the question remains whether users actually want to work with apps like this. In a sense, this is almost like an, using an app within an app. So a user has to open up ChatGPT and then install the app they want to use on top of that. And the latest data that we have shows that the majority of users are using ChatGPT on a mobile device rather than on a desktop. And this usage split has implications for the potential success of apps launched in the ChatGPT store. So for transactional conversational use cases, like those that you might expect from companies like Instacart, OpenTable or TripAdvisor, Using a ChatGPT app instinctively makes sense, so I can definitely see the potential here. But for more precise, intricate use cases, like building vibe-coded apps, for example, it feels as though working directly with the native application is a better option. For companies who are currently assessing their product distribution channels, AI app marketplaces are yet another channel that development teams may need to consider in the future. And here's how they currently all sit in context. This is a snapshot of all the potential channels that a company might consider when distributing their product. I've highlighted the two major new distribution channels for 2025, the first being MCP and the second being these new AI app marketplaces that not only include OpenAI, but also similar offerings from companies like Anthropic. So for example, Anthropic this week released a new update to their connectors library that includes custom built skills developed by Notion and others. Right now, a typical SaaS company might allocate most of its resources on desktop and mobile apps, but in the future, this could shift towards allocating more time towards MCP integrations and AI apps, as users potentially become less likely to open up the product they're using and instead head to tools like ChatGPT or Slack. So this example from Mintlify's Nick Kami shows a trend towards people using SaaS products from third parties, where he says it feels good to not open linear. What do you think? Are you planning to use these ChatGPT apps or is this just not something that you would use? Let me know in the comments below. Elsewhere this week, Google is launching an experimental new AI agent for Gmail called CC. So this is currently available as part of a beta trial and it's designed to help you to start your day by giving you a summary of your day ahead. This can include not only items from your calendar, but also from other aspects of your life. So things like upcoming rent payments or RSVs to personal invites. The agent does all this by accessing Gmail, Google Calendar, and Google Drive, as well as the wider web. You can also email the agent directly inside Gmail to ask it to help with anything throughout your day. So this is an intriguing concept, but this does feel like something that might get lost among all the other things that Google is currently shipping recently. The name CC also seems potentially confusing given that CC is a core functionality of sending an email. But early feedback from test users seems to be pretty positive, so we'll see how that one works out. Google also announced another experimental product called Opal, which is now available in their core Gemini app. And if you've not used Opal before, this is a tool that lets you build and share AI mini apps using natural language for a bunch of different use cases. So for product teams, some of the examples worth checking out include a business profiler that will conduct analysis on competitors and write up a summary, and a product research mini app that will conduct research and then craft a condensed synthesized report. One platform that continues to grow in popularity is WhatsApp. And this week, Eleven Labs launched its conversational agents on WhatsApp. Eleven Labs says that this will enable teams to design an agent once and then deploy it across multiple different platforms, including WhatsApp. The agent has both voice and chat abilities, which could make it a strong contender for customer service solutions. And speaking of conversational UX, this week, the food delivery app DoorDash has released a new app called Zesty that curates restaurants and allows users to discover them using some hyper-specific conversational searches like a low-key dinner in Williamsburg that's actually good for introverts. So this app is what I would describe as Gen Z Maximalist in its UI, and it looks like a valuable enough way to discover restaurants in its own right. 
but the ultimate goal here must be to drive more users to DoorDash. With Zesty, it looks like DoorDash is making a defensive land grab into the pre-transaction discovery layer. In other words, the space where consumers decide where to eat before they decide how to get the food. Zesty's social features could also generate intense signals and taste profiles that are far richer than the transactional data alone. So this could make it a very valuable asset for personalization in the core DoorDash app. This all assumes, of course, that users actually download it, and some users aren't particularly happy with the launch. They've accused DoorDash of building a clone to another app called Build Your Corner, which works in a very similar way. But with AI making it easier than ever to build or indeed to clone apps, and recent data showing that the number of apps published has increased for the first time in eight years, this could mark the start of a broader trend towards a building a family of apps as a way to generate data moats used in AI personalization. Now let's move on to some tools you can use. And we'll start this week with a product called ManyPi, or ManyPi, I'm not quite sure how you say it, but basically it's a play on the letters API, and it allows you to turn any website into an API. So this is a way to scrape data from any third-party website that you might be interested in, and then transform that data into a valid schema that you can then use in your own product. So if you're interested in exploring new tools for crafting your own APIs, then check out ManyPi. Next is the winner of the Mac OS app of the year. This is called Craft, and it's a space for notes, tasks, and big ideas. It's used by a mix of creative professionals and also product managers and designers who use it for things like taking notes, making travel plans, planning projects, and more. And based on my short time with this app, it's actually a very nicely designed app. So if you're somebody who appreciates a well-designed app for things that you can use every day, then check out Craft. And the final product for this week is something called Monocles, not to be confused with the magazine. This is also another desktop app, but this time it's designed to help you to stay focused and productive. And I really like the way that they've implemented this. So how this works is it essentially tries to help you to stay focused by helping you to feel calm when you work, write, browse and think. And it does this by blurring out the windows that are in the background and letting you focus on one window at a time. You can customize just how ambient this app feels by creating textures and blur effects that transform the experience of using a laptop. So this is for Mac OS, and if you're looking for new ways to stay focused, then this could be worth a look as well. Now let's move on to some data and trends for the week, and we'll start with this report from the company Greptile. This is taken from their State of AI Coding Report 2025, and this report contains a bunch of different data points, but this was one that stood out for me. This is the number of lines per developer, and it shows that it has grown from 4,450 to 7,839 in 2025, with medium-sized teams, so that, is developed, so that is teams with 6 to 15 developers, increasing their output from 7,005 lines to over 13,000 lines. Now, I know that measuring the productivity of teams based on the number of lines of code they're generated is not a reliable proxy, but it does likely show the multiplier effect of AI augmented engineering teams. So check out that report if you're interested in the impact of AI on coding. This week also saw the publication of the annual web report from Cloudflare, and this examines how we're using the web. The report found that global internet traffic grew 19% in 2025, with Google remaining the most visited website in the world. Android dominates mobile traffic with a 65% share, and despite new entrants throughout 2025, Chrome remains stubbornly stuck at just under 66% of the browser market. We can also see that AI browsers, despite all the hype surrounding those, have not made much of a dent, and this chart shows Perplexity and ChatGPT's Atlas gaining some initial traction, but then only to peter out after a few weeks. Other reports worth looking at this week is a new report from Twilio, which looks at the effectiveness of conversational AI. This report found that 83% of businesses say that they want to build more AI-powered customer service options, but in the same study, they found that 33% of users say that they have actually sworn at an AI or human conversational agent in frustration, and almost half of them say that when they did use an AI agent, it actually never resolved their issue. So if you're interested in learning specifically about building conversational AI agents into your own product, then check out that new report from Twilio. And the final report for this week is a new piece of analysis from SimilarWeb, which looks back at 2025, and this time it's focused specifically on AI products. So here's a couple of bits from those reports that stood out to me. 
The first is some numbers regarding OpenAI's Sora app. So this is the app that is focused specifically on AI-generated content. And according to this analysis, at least, the daily active users on the Sora app peaked at just 1 million in early November, but have since settled around the 750,000 mark. These numbers are certainly not huge compared to ChatGPT, which is almost at a billion users. But given that the app is only available in North America and Japan and a few other territories, and it only ever peaked at 1 million daily active users, it suggests that there is some stickiness for a product that is essentially AI-generated slot videos. We'll find out in 2026 whether there's a big enough market for Sora to grow from there. Elsewhere in the report, they also show that Notebook LM is actually a big success story for Google, with visitors now fast approaching 130 million. Some commentators on X recently praised Notebook LM's new functionality, including its ability to generate slides. So that could be worth checking out if you're interested in exploring that in a bit more detail. The report finds that users from AI search tools stay longer, view more pages, and also convert better, which is something to consider for your GEO strategy. And the percentage of Google visitors who also visited ChatGPT has grown from 1.6% in 2023 to 14.2% in 2025. So there is a significant crossover now between users who are using both ChatGPT and Google, but with Google experimenting with setting AI mode as its default, It'll be super interesting to see how this evolves next year. And on that note, I'd like to thank you for your support watching the channel in 2025. And if you are celebrating Christmas next week, I hope you have a good one. And I'll be back in the following week.